ever since I was a little kid, I've always loved language. I love learning new languages. I love thinking about how you can say something in one language and not in another. I like thinking about grammar. I like thinking about how some sentences are grammatical and others are not, and why, and how do we know this? And I have always been amazed by the fact that language is such a complex and rich system, but yet it can be learned by everyone. When I'm talking to you now, aside from being a little bit nervous, I don't have any problem putting out grammatical sentences. And similarly, when you're listening to me, it's not that you have to concentrate very hard to understand what I'm saying. In fact, language comes so natural to us that I think many of you may not even realize how complex it actually is. This is something that you start noticing when you're learning a new language and you realize all of a sudden that putting words together to coherent phrases that are also grammatical is actually very difficult. But when you're speaking your own language, typically you just speak, it's easy. You're not aware of how complicated it is. So to give you an indication of what I mean when I say that language is complicated and structured, I wanted to give you some examples. When we look at the following sentence, the defendant defends her dissertation. This is a super short sentence and already a first observation that we can make here is that the reason that we can understand it is that the words are in a very particular order. And this is also the only order in which it works. This one's correct. If I shuffle around the words, I just get gibberish. Or if I shuffle around the words to the dissertation defense or defendant, I even get a sentence with a different meaning. This is already some basic form of structure that says the order of the words tells us what the meaning of the sentence is. Then, even in this short sentence, we can already see a short distance dependency between the subject defendant, defendant and the verb defense. The subject is singular, so the verb also needs to be singular. In this case, this is a very short dependency, but it can also be longer. For instance, if I add another verb at the end, the defendant defends her dissertation and obtains her title, I cannot use different forms. It has to be this form. Now, I can even make this dependency longer by adding a bunch of relative clauses. The defendant who has researched artificial neural network defends her dissertation and obtains her title. Still, there is this link, and we can do it. We can make it even longer. For four years at the University of Amsterdam, Defends her dissertation by answering questions of an independent doctorate committee. Still sentences longer and longer, we can actually quite easily understand them. Please don't attempt to read this. If I shuffle around the words, I use the computer to do this. You get complete gibberish that is not only ungrammatical, but also completely ununderstandable. In linguistics, we can represent this kind of structure with upside down trees that express which things go together in an hierarchical way. So for instance, the defendant together forms a unit, her dissertation is the object of the sentence, defends her dissertation is the predicate of the sentence, and together we have the, the tree for the whole sentence. If we want to make a relative clause in it, make the sentence a bit longer, no problem. Let's create some space, insert a relative clause, make a little tree for the relative clause, and there we go. We have a tree that indicates in an hierarchical way how this sentence is built up from the phrases. Now, it turns out that uh, sentences in general can really be described quite well by these kind of trees. And this in itself is kind of a mystery when you think about what we use to process sentences, namely the human brain. And very oversimplistically put, the human brain is an extremely large connection of neurons that are communicating with each other. And how these neurons together represent things like hierarchy, grammar, or structure is really kind of unclear. These are the questions that um, I have been thinking about for a long time and that I'm also trying to answer in my, uh, in my research. I mean, how is it possible that the brain that seems to be relatively unstructured in a way can process language so well? And if language is a product of our brain, why does it look like this in the first place? Now, if you've ever talked with me about my research, you may at this point start wondering why, um, what is it, halfway in my presentation, I still haven't said a single word about computers. 
because typically when people ask me what I do, I say that I make computer models of language. In fact, I do, but I make these computer models to try to get an answer to these questions that I described to you before. The type of model that I use for my research are artificial neural networks. And to explain to you why I think they can be useful to answer these kinds of questions, I want to tell you three things about them. First of all, artificial network or neural networks are surprisingly remarkably good at processing language. They are currently the best applied model of language that we have. And um, you may not know what an artificial neural network is, but I'm fairly sure that many of you have in some way indirectly used them. For instance, to give an example, when I, uh, when I just tweaked the audio settings of Zoom and I wanted to reduce the echo, the information bot button said that what it would do is using artificial neural networks to suppress the echo. If you're using Google Translate, a neural network will give you uh, a translation. If you are using next word prediction in an email or in a text message, it's likely a neural network that does it for you. So neural networks are really surprisingly good at processing language. And I say surprisingly because neural networks in some ways like the brain are also large connections, slightly less large than, than uh, actual brains, large collections of artificial neurons that are connected to each other. And also for them, it's kind of unclear how they can process language that seems so structured. Now, the third one, some of you may also start wondering how it's possible that I have a model of language processing and I'm saying that it's unclear how it processes language because in a sort of traditional computer science -y perspective, this is kind of weird, right? Because you program your model to do something. This is the third thing that I want to tell you about neural networks, namely they are self-learning systems. So I don't tell them at every point in time, do this, do that, do that. I don't program them. Instead, I tell them how they can learn. And then I show them a ton of examples, for instance, of sentences and a translation, and it learns itself. It turns out this works quite well, but of course this means that we do not know what they actually learned. Now, in some fields, this is uh, perceived as some sort of problem because of course it can also be dangerous if you have a model and you don't understand what it's doing. But in my field, I see this rather as an opportunity because it means that we have a model that can process well language using an unstructured network that uh, shares some properties with the human brain. So what I'm going to do is I will use these neural networks as some sort of proxy to try to find the answers to the questions that I was giving you before without actually having to cut open someone's head or do many experiments uh, with, uh, with participants. So here I have this uh, triangle that is presenting uh, this synergy between these three things. Now, if you are actually getting curious about the answer to these questions, I will have to slightly disappoint you, I'm afraid. Not only because I am running out of time in this presentation, but also because, and I have to tell you this honestly, these questions are questions that people have been thinking about and researching for many, many, many years. And I would consider myself extremely lucky if I can find some real answers, even in 30 years. So instead of giving you some answers, what I would like to close with is another question to you. Namely, next time that you are struggling to make a sentence in a language that you, is not your own, it's not your own. you're saying a sentence in a language that is not your own and you're struggling to make it grammatical or making maybe you're making a mistake or next time that you hear someone else making a mistake in your own language but you understand him nevertheless or even next time that you're speaking with someone and you realize how easy that is stop for just a second and think about how amazing that is and think about what a 
beautiful mystery, natural languages. Thank you.